to be on my bed again. What the hell did you come back here for anyway? I know you're too cold back east. I wanted to see Rocky. Cher plays a biker and the mother of a bright handicapped kid in Mask, one of the new movies we're going to review this week. And I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. In addition to Mask, we'll also be reviewing Melissa Gilbert in Sylvester, the story of a very bright and courageous young woman and her horse, and we'll also take a look at the career of comic filmmaker Albert Brooks in our special x-ray segment at the end of the show. But first, Roger begins with Christopher Reeve's latest picture. And Roger, it looks like we have a surprise guest in the balcony. <laughs> hey! He's a little early this week. Hello, Aroma. The educated skunk is here with our stinker of the week, the week's worst movie. And we do have a stinker this week, The Aviator, which says something mm -hmm. that you don't often see these days. It takes all the basic cliches from two totally different genres and combines them into one remarkably and almost transcendentally silly movie. <laughs> on the one hand, you have your basic story about two against the wilderness. And on the other hand, you have your basic love story about the guy who doesn't understand women and the smart uh, Alec woman who hates the guy and how they hate each other so much that eventually they just can't stand each other and right. so they have only one choice, which is to fall in love. Mm. The Aviator has room enough for both of those bargain basement plots because this is a movie that doesn't contain a single ounce of thought. Here's a typical scene. Christopher Reeve is an airmail pilot in the 1920s, and Rosanna Arquette is a spoiled rich brat who was his passenger, and he has just told her not to smoke near the wreckage of the plane. So here's what happens next. Sure, they'll find us. It'll be next spring. They'll take us down to two blocks of ice. I can't listen to you anymore. That's the truth. I'm going to lie to you like you're a kid. Hey. You called me a two-time loser. It was just an expression. Well, you're right. You're absolutely right. Last time I crashed like this, I killed a man. So then they have a few more little misfortunes. For example, Christopher Reeve almost has his arm chewed off by a wolf, and then she breaks her leg, so he has to try to carry and drag her to civilization, which you might think would be sort of hard for a guy with wolf bites all over his arm, but he hardly notices those superficial <laughs> flesh wounds. And meanwhile, they confess their innermost secrets and wind up liking each other. And I think those are the basic highlights of the movie, except, of course, for the scene where they fight over the jelly donuts. Now, that was very exciting. Yeah, they, you know, he wants the bigger piece of the jelly donut, <laughs> and she uh, has the bigger piece, and they fight. No, they have right. a fight over a jelly donut. This movie is transcendentally bad. You got it. Uh -huh. There isn't a single scene in this film that's good. Not one scene. It is uniformly awful and boring. Mm -hmm. They are not... This film was shot a year and a half ago in Yugoslavia, and they are not... They are only now releasing it in parts of the country. It will not be released, I'm told. Get this, <laughs> in Los Angeles and New York, the capitals of the film In other words, world. they want to make sure it doesn't qualify for the Academy Award. <laughs> they want to make sure that nobody connected with the movie industry sees this picture because it could hurt these careers of two very good actors, Christopher Reeve and Rosanna Arquette. This is garbage. As this is an example of what happens when talented people get in the wrong project because we have respect not only for them, but there are other people in this movie. Tyne Daly, Scott Wilson, yeah. who in other places and yep. other roles have done okay, and in this, it's disastrous. They time. all took a paycheck, let's be fair. They well, took a I'm paycheck. Glad they got something out of it. Yeah, well, we didn't. Coming up next at the movie is a film that argues that ugliness is only skin deep. Perhaps I should speak to the boy's father. Perhaps you should speak to the Pope, too. He'd be a lot easier to find. The film is Peter Bogdanovich's Mask, a superb new film that is certain to be one of the year's most talked about pictures. Mask is probably going to be known as sort of an adolescent elephant man telling the true story of a badly deformed California teenage boy who has a grotesque lion-like face, but who otherwise is a model youngster, brilliant in school, collects baseball cards, and is very devoted to his mother. And his mother is a remarkable character in her own right. She's played by Cher in another surprisingly effective performance by the former pop singer. The boy's mother is a tough-talking motorcycle club mama, and she is absolutely devoted to her child. She knows there is no reason, for example, why her son Rocky can't attend a public junior high school just like any other kid. Yes, 
Never mind. Hi, I'm here to uh, register my son for the ninth grade. Well, uh, Mrs. No, 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 Mrs. I'm Rusty Dennis. This is my son, Rocky. Please sit down. Oh, we're running a little bit late, so could you uh, move it along? This is a public junior high school, Miss Dennis. There are special schools with wonderful facilities that might be more appropriate for his needs. Do you teach algebra and biology and English here? <laughs> of course. Those are his needs. Perhaps I should speak to the boy's father. Perhaps you should speak to the Pope, too. He'd be a lot easier to find. Because I do feel that for the good of my students, as well as your son, I'm going to need some additional information. Look, Mr. Sims, you know what? Don't jerk me around. I'm not in the mood. I've had a real crappy day so far. First, I find out that we're in the wrong school district. i got to come down here and play pussyfoot with you. This is a copy of our lease. This is a copy of Rocky's birth certificate. And this is his last report card from Stevens Junior High School, where he was in the top 5% of his class. And I got some additional information for you. Uh, my lawyer's name is B.D. Higgins. Well, right about now, you're probably asking yourself, okay, what does the kid look like we couldn't see from that scene? You want to see him, right? Well, I would like you to see him. Unfortunately, in a rather crass marketing move, Universal Pictures is not releasing any pictures or scenes from the movie Mask to show the boy. They just edit him out, edit his face out. But that attitude is really unconscionable for this film because this, mm -hmm. that attitude treats this movie as if it were some kind of carnival freak show. You're only going to pay your five bucks. That's the only way you're going to see this kid. But that's not the kind of picture this is. This isn't a freak show picture. On the contrary, masks ask us to confront physical deformity head on, face to face. Realize that it isn't the big deal that it, we think it is. That we should be looking at people's hearts, not their faces. That's the beauty of this next scene where Cher talks to her longtime lover, Sam Elliott, about her son. Sir, I can't um, write a letter to Ricky and I miss him. Maybe it's sleep, Rusty. No, no. Come on. You help me. Come you on. help me. You help me write the letter, please. Dear Rocky, um, I miss you. And you're away at camp. You're not in your room. And and I miss you. And and I'm sorry that I was bad. And oh, Screech is here. And Gar is here. And. I love you. Love, Mom. Love, Mom. With the little kiss. This is one of the most beautiful love stories we've had in the movies in quite a long time, the love story between the mother and the son. Mask pulls out all the stops in the story you could see in that scene, giving Cher not only a lot of emotion, but also a drug problem to beat. It also gives the boy Rocky a love affair at his summer camp with a blind girl. Now, I presume all of this is true. It's based on a true story, we're told. It has to be true because no writer, I think, would have dared to make all of this up. But more important, Mask is a beautiful film that should trigger all sorts of wonderful, tender thoughts as we watch the story of two unforgettable characters, the mother, as played by Cher, and Rocky, played so effectively in a mask by Eric Stoltz. I was genuinely touched by Mask. I was too, Gene. And you know, this is a wonderful example of a couple of comebacks because both Peter Bogdanovich and Cher have been mm -hmm. trashed over the last four or five years for various misfortunes they've had in their professional careers. Mm -hmm. Here's a comeback for both of them. A great picture with a great performance. And Cher, after comeback to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, and mm -hmm. after Silkwood, and now this picture, where did she come from? I know. She was a has-been singer, and now suddenly she's one of our best dramatic actresses. And picking this, interesting projects. And interesting projects, and her relationship with the kid, and the kid's performance. Eric Stoltz is so good in this film. I, I looked at his, the way that he looked, for about 10 seconds, I thought, gee, that, you know, that's too bad. And then after that, I was captivated by the person inside, by the performance and inside, by the his personality. Mouth, all you're seeing is mouth, and he's wearing dentures and, uh -huh. uh, and uh, eyeballs. Uh, let me say, we get jaded real easy mm -hmm. in this job. We see everything, and, and, and heart-wrenching pictures that are mm -hmm. supposed to be, uh, my, my guard goes up. Usually when, the, broke through. usually when I see a picture that's supposed to break my heart, my first impulse is to start laughing at yeah, it because yeah. I know it's going to be cornball. Yeah, this was not. It was touching. And I'll tell you this, here's a good test of a picture like this. You say, well, you like it because who's going to pick on a film about a crippled kid? Mm -hmm. Well, I say this. You take that crippled kid out of this picture, mm -hmm. put a normal face on him, and you still have a very good picture mm -hmm. because the relationship between mother and mm -hmm. son is mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. and the mother's network of all our motorcycle gang friends, that's interesting, too. Mm -hmm. So it's not doing it just with, with that face. It's doing it with a terrific screenplay. Not at all, and I think you're right to say that they should have shown the face on the screen because you might think at home, gee, he's going to look 
so horrible that I won't be able to enjoy the picture. Actually, the soul of this kid and the physical appearance of him in his own way, he's very beautiful. Next at the movies, a brave girl and a brave horse. Funky teenage girl and a brave horse that somehow she just knows can be a champion. It's just only both of them are given a chance. I, I think we've already seen that movie about 16 times. You read that just like Robbie Benson would say. Thank you very much. Hey, Dad, I know that horse can win. <laughs> we've seen this movie all the way back to National Velvet. Right. I know it can win. But there's always a chance we're going to be surprised. And one of the surprises about a new movie named Sylvester is the way it takes that tired old story and makes it effective and interesting. The movie stars Melissa Gilbert from TV's Little House on the Prairie as the tough teenage girl from Texas. And then there's old-timer Richard Farnsworth as the grizzled cowboy who can teach her everything he knows about horses if only he wants to. And then there's also a horse which she names Sylvester Stallone for obvious reasons. She thinks this horse can get up off the mat to mix the metaphor. Mm -hmm. Here's a scene where she takes the horse for its first steeplechase run. <laughs> standard stuff, but here's a scene that shows that this movie is a lot more than routine as she confronts her old boyfriend. I uh, need some gas and I don't have any money. John Foster told me about Red. So was he drunk? He always talks too much when he's drunk. Why didn't she come talk to me? Like it, okay, Matt. Don't make a big thing out of this. I mean it. I'll buy you dinner if you smile. I'm busy. That's Michael Sheffling as the boyfriend. Sylvester develops in some fairly predictable ways. I think that somehow we know that that girl and her horse are going to make it into the steeplechase finals in Kentucky, and that somehow they haven't come all that way merely to finish last. But meanwhile, <laughs> there's some really good performances in this movie, especially by Melissa Gilbert whose character is a lot more complicated and grown up than we expect, and by Richard Farnsworth, who is sort of a bum, but also sort of her father figure. This is a, this is a good movie. It reminds me of some of the other real good teenage Southwest movies like Tex, Tex and The Last Picture Show. Yeah, I was caught totally by surprise. As soon as I see where the story's going with the horses, I think, well, okay, mm -hmm. win the race, whatever, and end of movie. Big deal. Yeah. But you're quite right. Melissa Gilbert is the reason why this one works. And I was caught totally by surprise, not only by her, but by the role. Mm -hmm. I think that she's excellent in the role, real surprisingly tough for just a cute little girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the role is surprisingly tough. I think a lot of actresses, Jodie Foster, somebody like that, could have done this exceedingly mm -hmm. well. And it, what it really told me is, my God, women, young women, aren't given a chance to play full characters in it. This woman is tough. That's right. She's weak. She's all over the That's map. That's right. Here she is. She's, six, she's 16 years old. Probably. She's raising her two little brothers because uh, they don't have any parents anymore. She goes to this guy, Richard Farnsworth, who is totally messing up his life and right. says, look, I know you can help me. Here's what I want you to do, yeah. and you're going to do it. And he does it. Yeah. And she gets what she wants in a very positive way. It's a real good movie. In we that have sense. had strong roles for women with these three Save the Farm movies. Mm -hmm. I will stack this role up with any of those. Oh, I put it ahead of a couple of them. <laughs> this is a very good role, and again, a very good performance by Melissa Gilbert. Coming up next at the movies, a look at a very funny filmmaker named Brooks, but his first name is not Mel. Gee, isn't that something? Wouldn't you think there'd be leather in there? I tell you what, if you buy the car, I'll put some shoes in it, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, I've come here to live. I'm trying to change my life. You couldn't change your life on a hundred thousand dollars? Um, what have you got for me? Any jobs? Our x-ray subject this week, comedian and comic filmmaker Albert Brooks. Very quietly, and not with much commercial success, 37-year-old Albert Brooks has built a cult reputation as one of the funniest men in America, but his humor is so anchored in reality that he remains an acquired taste. One, frankly, I wish more people would acquire, <laughs> even though he does regularly appear on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Brooks got his start in the 1970s as a stand-up comic and achieved considerable popularity through his short films he made during the early days of Saturday Night Live, including his most famous film, a parody about a school for comedians. Now let's talk more about the comedy talent test. When you send in for this free test, fill it out and mail it back to us, 
We'll have one of our professors grade you personally. Now, he won't lie to you and say you're funny if you're not. It's too costly a waste of time to have our professors grade students they know are no good. But here's the exciting part. If you qualify, everything can be done in your spare time at home. Albert Brooks was one of the first of his generation to make fun of the business of being funny. Steve Martin and Andy Kaufman would follow his example. In making his leap to the movies, though, Brooks picked as his first target the documentary film. In his comedy called Real Life, he tries to capture the essence of an American family, and he's really annoying while doing it. Listen, I would just like to go be alone for a little while. I think that I need to be alone. Now. Okay, could we come with you? No, I really want to be alone. Well? Just by myself. All right, we're going to have to deal with this thing later because this really wasn't in the rules. It's all right, go ahead. Would you take the little car, though? We're going to drive to work with Warren. We'd like to use the station wagon. It's just hard to fit both cameras in there. Could one person come with you? classic moment. The fake documentary This is Spinal Tap received all sorts of acclaim last year, but Brooks's fake documentary, the one we just saw a scene from real life, was just as funny and four years earlier. Brooks's second film was Modern Romance, with Albert playing an insanely jealous guy who refuses to give up seeing a girl he only likes sexually. The more she rejects him, the more he pursues her. I couldn't help calling. I called because I love you. I mean, it's not so difficult to make a call. You press a few numbers, it's done. How could you call that number? I'd want you to call the number. I'd want you to feel that way. It's an invasion of my privacy. What should be private? Look, we weren't even together then. Now, that was August. You left me, remember? What was I supposed to do, not make friends? Well, I didn't make any friends. I didn't make one long-distance call. You want to see my bill during those months? $8, $8.50. He's been so jealous about her that he's been reading her phone bills. Very mm -hmm. funny bit. And now, this year, Albert Brooks has delivered a hilarious yuppie comedy called Lost in America, in which he plays a young advertising executive whose wife loses the family fortune in Las Vegas. And so it's up to Albert to try to talk casino boss into giving him his money back. We lost our nest egg here. I realize you lost a lot of money. Your room and your food comped free. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't mean that. That's not what, that's not what I meant. Um, <clears throat> all right. I'm going to tell you this idea now. And please be secretive. Because if another hotel hears about this, they'll take it. This is my business. As the boldest experiment in advertising history, you give us our money back. I beg your pardon? Give us our money back. Think of the publicity. The Hilton Hotel has these billboards all over Los Angeles where the winners of these slot machine jackpots, their faces are all over L.A., and I know that works. I've seen people at corners look up and say, maybe I'll go to the Hilton. Well, you give us our money back. Uh, I, I, I don't even know now because I'm just coming off the top of my head, but a visual where if we had a billboard and the Desert Inn handed us our nest egg back, this gives the Desert Inn, really, Vegas is not associated with feeling. Somehow you just know he's not going to get his money back. Mm -hmm. That's funny stuff. And that was Gary Marshall, the writer-director of The Flamingo Kid, a good film in its own right, as the casino boss. Now, many critics have complained that Albert Brooks's character always whines too much, same voice all the time. But I like his whining. I think he's simply displaying the passions that rule the baby boom generation that he's a part of. These kids want to be artistically hip, like in the movie Real Life, make an honest documentary. They want to have the perfect marriage, as in modern romance and they want lots of money, as in Lost of America. And they're all going to whine until they get it. That's the message of his films. All this from Albert Brooks, one of the best, most underappreciated young filmmakers we have. You mentioned a lot of great things about Albert Brooks. I'll mention one more, and that's okay. his fabulous ear for the way that people really talk. I love that scene in Lost in America where he's saying, do I get leather? And the guy says, Mercedes leather. I mean, that's that absolute nuance of human speech. And also in the, in the scene we saw, when he says Santa Claus instead of Santa Claus. Right. It's very obvious, but not one out of a hundred comedy writers would listen carefully enough to know how much funnier Santa Claus is. And it goes all the way through his movies, that funny dialogue touch. Yeah, he's a writer. And, you know, some people say, well, he shouldn't star in this movie. Somebody mm -hmm. else should star in this movie. 
I enjoy him in his movies. I mean, he gets manic and crazy. We said this during the review, that sure. Gene Wilder is the best known guy for getting manic and crazy. Wilder, I don't think, does it well anymore. Albert Brooks does it very well. Does a great job. I liked uh, Lost in America a whole lot, and I want to see another movie by him. I wish he'd work more quickly. Let's take another look now at the movies we reviewed this week. We both put a thumbs down on Aviator, the silly survival story about two lovers who crash mm -hmm. land. But two thumbs up for Mask, and for that great performance by Cher as the biker mom of a deformed son. And we both also like Sylvester with Melissa Gilbert as a young steeplechase rider, and Richard Farnsworth as the cowboy who coaches her. And Sylvester is a real surprise this mm -hmm. week, but the sleeper, I think, is Peter Bogdanovich's Mask with that really surprisingly good performance by Cher. That's a good movie. It's very good, and I don't know if it's such a surprise anymore, as we pointed out. She's done a lot of good performances. Right. Now, switching back to Sylvester, I want to credit the writer who came <laughs> up with that terrific part for Melissa Gilbert. Carol Sobieski is the writer's name, and as long as I've been doing the show, I've been getting letters. You don't credit the writers, That's right? We come up with the stuff, and you, all you but mentioned is directors. You mean the actors don't make up their own dialogue? <laughs> right. So <laughs> Carol Sobieski is the writer. Of okay. Sylvester. So much for this week. Next time, we'll review Baby, The Secret of the Lost Legend, about a couple discovering a bunch of dinosaurs while on vacation in Africa. Sean Young and William Cat co-star. And until then, we'll see you at the movies.